This is the next part of the lecture covering Newton's first law, the law of inertia, which I still have written on the board here from the end of the previous part. An object moves at a constant velocity unless acted upon by a force. As I said earlier, we'll fill in this blank space here in front of the word force eventually, but we'll get to that at a later portion of the lecture. Okay, now, before we use the law of inertia to explain qualitatively all sorts of different aspects of motion that the ancient Greeks would have struggled to have explained, let me first of all explain to you what is meant by the word inertia. The word inertia is not a definition. It's a name. It is a name given to this property of objects, that is, their tendency to remain at a constant velocity unless acted upon by a force. The name for this property, once again, this is fundamental to nature, is inertia. So the word inertia refers to the tendency of an object to remain at a constant velocity. Once again, it's a name given to this fundamental property of nature. Okay, now, as I said, let's go ahead and use the law of inertia to explain qualitatively all sorts of different aspects of motion. Let's start with situations that you are familiar with. For example, let's say you're in a car. Let's say that the car is moving at a constant velocity down the freeway. This then means that it's moving at a constant speed at a straight line. And then let's say that the driver applies the brakes to the car. Now, when this happens, a force is exerted upon the car, causing it to slow down. What happens to you, however, in your seat? Well, you continue going forwards because you have inertia. That is a tendency to remain at a constant velocity. You will continue at a constant velocity until the force acts upon you. In other words, the force that is applied to the car is applied to the car and not you. So then therefore you continue at a constant velocity because you have inertia until a force is applied to you. This is either the friction that occurs between yourself and the seat the seat belt, the dashboard if you're not wearing your seat belt, or, God help you, the asphalt 50 feet in front of the car after a car accident. So make sure that you wear your seat belt. It's obviously there for a reason. It's there because of the law of inertia. Now here's a very simple demonstration in a slightly different context of this scenario. Okay, I have right here a very simple version of what is called an accelerometer. An accelerometer detects accelerations. For example, you have a three-dimensional electronic accelerometer inside of your smartphone. In this particular case, this accelerometer consists of this case, and then there's this red liquid here inside the case. Okay, now what I'm going to do is mimic this scenario. In order to do so, however, what I'm going to have to do is walk in this direction, for example, at a constant speed in a straight line, and then I'm going to slow down suddenly. Watch what happens when I do. So let me go ahead and get started, and now I slow down and stop, like so. Notice that the liquid bunched up over here on the left-hand side, my left-hand side, that is, of the case. The reason for that is because when I slowed it down, I exerted a force on the case causing it to slow down. Did I exert that force on the liquid? No. So then therefore, because the liquid has inertia, it then continues to move at a constant velocity, a constant speed in the straight line, until a force is exerted upon it. Okay, here's another situation that you're familiar with, also involving a car. Let's say you're in the car and it's initially at rest. So then therefore, it's at a constant velocity of zero. And then the driver applies the accelerator to the car. When this happens, a force is exerted upon the car, causing the car, accelerate, causing the car to accelerate forwards. What happens to you, however, sitting in your seat? Well, if you're thinking to yourself that you move backwards like so, well, that's actually incorrect. What's actually happening is that you are remaining at rest relative to the ground because you have inertia. In this case, a tendency to remain at rest. You will remain at rest until a force is exerted upon you. In other words, the car is accelerating ahead of you, whereas you are remaining at rest relative to the ground until a force is exerted upon you. That force, of course, is caused by the seat back behind you. I can also use the accelerometer to illustrate this scenario as well. 
In this case, we'll begin at rest. And now what I'm gonna do is very quickly and sharply and suddenly accelerate the accelerometer in this direction, like so. And notice what happened when I did. The liquid bunched up here on, for me, the right-hand side of the case. The reason for that is because I exert the force on the case, causing it to accelerate in this direction. I do not exert the force on the liquid. Therefore, the liquid remains at rest until a force is exerted upon it. We see that as it bunching up here on this side of the case. Here's how you can think of it, however, in the context, for example, of the car. Okay, so let's say that here's the car, for example, like so. And here you are as a passenger and you're initially at rest. So you're at a constant velocity of zero. Okay, and then there's a force exerted upon the car. And the car accelerates to the right-hand side here on the board. Okay, now as it begins to accelerate then, relative to the ground, the following then happens. Okay, here you are in your seat like so, and then think of, for example, this dotted line right here as representing the point associated with, say, the ground, a reference frame. So then therefore, relative to the ground, you are remaining at rest because you have inertia, a tendency to remain at a constant velocity of zero until a force is exerted upon you. We can illustrate that very easily, once again, with the accelerometer. So the way that this accelerometer works is that you know that the accelerometer is accelerating if you see the liquid as something else other than horizontal, like so. So then therefore, when you see the liquid as something other than horizontal, this then means that the accelerometer is accelerating. Okay, here's another scenario from a car that you may be familiar with. Let's say that you're sitting in the passenger seat in a car, and now let's say that the driver executes a sharp right-hand turn. What happens to you inside of the car? Well, you may be saying to yourself, well, I feel myself lean to the left-hand side like so as you execute the turn. That's not quite, however, what's happening. What's happening is the following. Okay, so let's say, for example, I'm gonna draw this as a top view. Here's a top view of the car, like so. Give your wheels. And here's you as a passenger inside the car. And then let's say that the car executes a sharp right-hand turn, like so. Okay, let me draw the car right here while it's in mid-turn. Okay, in incidentally, by the way, there is a force exerted upon the car, causing it to turn to the right-hand side. That force, however, is not exerted upon you. So then therefore, you have a tendency to remain in motion in a straight line at a constant speed like so until a force is exerted upon you, causing you to turn. Once again, this dashed line here you can think of in reference with respect to the ground. So then therefore, with respect to the ground, you are remaining at a constant velocity, a constant speed in a straight line until a force is exerted upon you, causing you to turn. From your point of view, however, inside the car, you feel as if you got pushed to the left-hand side. That's not quite what's happening, however. What's actually happening is that the car is turning around you while you remain at a constant velocity like so. Okay, here's another version of this scenario. I can do this as a simple demonstration. Okay, what I have right here is a coffee can, like so, the coffee can is empty. I'm gonna tilt my phone, by the way, towards my sink as I do this demonstration, so bear with me. There we go, like so. And then I'm filling up the coffee can here, in this case, about halfway or so with water. <laughs> And now, even with the complication of gravity and at a relatively slow speed, like so, I could actually very easily and safely keep the water here inside the can. And then let me go ahead and dump out the water, like so. No, it's not magic, it's physics. Okay, let me go ahead and tilt my camera back in this direction. Bear with me as I do.
Let me double check that. There we go. Like so. Okay, let me briefly explain what's happening in this simple demonstration involving the coffee can. Okay, here's the can like so, attached to the rope like this. And then right here is the water inside of the can. And then I'm turning the can over this circular arc like so. Let's say I'm turning the can here clockwise on the diagram for simplicity. And then right here, I'm gonna go ahead and draw a vector. Think of this vector right here as a representation of the water's inertia. So then therefore the water has a tendency to remain in motion like that until an external agent exerts a force upon it. Okay, now when I turn the coffee can like so, I then exert a force on the coffee can by means of the rope causing it to turn. Do I exert that force on the water? No. So then therefore the combination of the water's inertia, its tendency to remain in motion like so, and the fact that I exert a force on the can causing the can to turn, as you saw, even at a relatively slow speed, this then allows me to safely keep the water inside the can. Yes, if I turn the coffee can slowly enough, then yes, the water would eventually fall out. That would look something like this. No, I'm not gonna fill it up with water again. Let me get the coffee can. Okay, like so. And then I'll turn it more slowly. So, and then eventually the string goes slack, and then therefore at that point the water would become a projectile. For some of the more advanced classes, I'll lead you through a procedure later on in this unit where we can actually calculate the minimum safe speed such that the water stays safely inside the can. Okay, let me go ahead and conclude <clears throat> this portion of the lecture with that demonstration and explanation.